This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean and by Ting. Go to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device or your first month of service. Welcome to Linux Action Show, episode 340. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. Good morning to you. Good morning. Are you ready for me to tell folks about the huge show today? Oh, absolutely. All right. Well, coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, in the second half of the show, Charlie Reisinger is joining us. He's from Penn Manor School District, and if you have a sharp, sharp memory, you might remember that from earlier this year when they were our Runs Linux. Charlie helped run a project that deployed over 1,700 Linux laptops to the students. You won't believe the amount of access they've given these students and why they've done it and how they've integrated them right into the help desk system. It is a truly inspiring story, and we're going to chat with Charlie in today's episode. And of course, in the news segment, the Yala tablet is real, and man, is it funded. <laughs> we'll talk about that. And there's been a few surprises this week. Mozilla and Firefox had a wee bit of a falling out. We'll talk about that. And there is a new laptop that promises to be the perfect Linux laptop. Ooh. But is it legit? We'll discuss that and the rumors around the new Ubuntu press release we may be seeing next week from a phone manufacturer. Now, of course, this is also the most expensive news segment in the history of Linux Action Show for me personally. Ooh. You'll find out why. And then in the feedback segment, we've got some good follow-up. I grabbed a touch screen, got it hooked up. I'll tell you all about my experiences so far with touch under Linux. And we've got a couple of fun announcements in the feedback segment as well. So like I am saying, Huge show, hey, Matt, because hey. you know what I didn't even mention? What's that? Our picks. Oh, my God. We didn't even touch that. Let's start right there. Our oh. Runs Linux this week comes in from Micro89. Record Runs Linux submissions this week to the subreddit. Record breaking. Wow. So I've bookmarked a few of them. Thank you, everybody. Keep sending them in, too. I love it. But this one, I, I don't know, Matt. Uh, something about Linux in cars is right. super exciting to it's, me. It's kind of, it addresses yeah. like multiple. Uh, Dude, we've had it on the, your head. the phones and the tablets, Matt. Yeah. That's, pff, had old, that for a long time. Old. old. In the car, Matt. Mm. Now, but what's, what's the biggest problem with in car entertainment systems? They get old. Yeah. Right? You buy be. a car and then like a couple of years. Or they're not years, loud enough. <laughs> I like you. You're so hip, man. <laughs> you rock. No, you know, like you get it. You get a yeah. map system, right. and it gets old. You get exactly. like a something with Pandora built in. It's exactly. it's old and jank, and it needs to be fixed. And using Linux in this environment could really reduce the cost for manufacturers for keeping these updated. And the folks over at Jaguar and Land Rover have already recognized this. So this is where Micro 89's picks comes in. This is so cool, Jaguar. System servers and cars run Linux. This is a new system. Now, the audio in this clip isn't super awesome because it's at a convention floor, but what the guy says is really, really important. So this is a systems architect over at Jaguar, and uh, he is talking about how they use Linux on the back end to deploy over-the-air updates to Linux running cars. This is so cool. It's a little hard to understand, but you got to hear it. So what he's already said, this is he's setting this up here, is... This car shipped with a pretty good surround sound system. Mm -hmm. However, it turns out that the car actually supports 3D sound, but the software just doesn't have an option for it. Oh. So from the servers and, of course, uh, user accepting, he's going to push an over-the-air update to the Linux box that runs inside this car. You immediately get a push available that audio settings 2.0 is now available for download. We want to download it, and we immediately start to download. And at the end of the download, we install it, and the software installation is now completed. Now, if we go back here to the audio settings, which previously did not have a 3D sound, we now have a So now it has all of the settings that he pushed, the 3D audio settings and things like that. Now, she asks about the hardware and software. Added value to the vehicle through in software over the air push. Now, which software are you using on what device? This is uh, just a standard web. That's a GNOME 3 laptop on a this Lenovo. Here we use Tizen IDI and extra software from automotive grade Linux and the Linux Foundation. And on top of that, we've added our own internal JLR software, but it's all open source. What do you wish people knew about this technology? That it's the future of how the industry 
industry needs to develop uh, their entertainment units. We can't. We, ne- we have to stop reinventing the wheel again and again. So he says we have to stop reinventing the I wheel agree. again and again. So if you didn't catch it, or if you're listening to the audio version, his laptop is a Lenovo box running a GNOME 3 with it looks like Firefox on there that he's using to access the Linux servers on the back end. The car entertainment system is running Tizen, and they push an update to it. It's a gorgeous interface. And it is, if you think about it today, uh, so I have a I have a Acura that has an in-car entertainment system with right. maps and traffic, and uh, this is how I get updates today, is we get a letter in the mail. <laughs> like, like, in the mail, Matt. I don't even check the wow. mail very often. Then you open wow. you open this this letter that I Blow believe is derived from it. trees. I'm not it sounds yeah. very oh, arcane God. to me. You pull out this magical wood paper and on there it says, <laughs> Hey, could you schedule a time? Yeah, right. To come into the dealership so that way we can charge you $150 oh, to update So not, your not only are they killing trees, they're gonna they're gonna make you drive somewhere yeah. to have some guy try yeah. and talk you into a new car, essentially. Right. No, and so this is like put my car on the Wi Fi or pair it with my Bluetooth and smartphone and receive these updates. Of course I want this. I, I think it's so neat to say this is the future, uh, and it's powered by Linux. And we've got people in the audience that have worked on this yeah. very initiative, so it's really exciting from that standpoint. So, too. I mean, for me, it's like, you know, when I, so when I roll out of the Lamborghini and I pop the 8-track <laughs> out, you know, after listening to some Credence, <laughs> I, I find that, you know, it's, it's irritating that I can't just... You know, right. I, I have to get a whole new system yeah. for my car versus no. a software update no. like this addresses. Yeah. yeah, and when you're driving a Lamborghini with an eight track, you got bigger problems in life. You do, you do. You don't, you don't got time to schedule no. a trip to the dealership. I know. I know. So really Sorry. cool to see, uh, com- to see the computers and cars finally actually turn into computers <laughs> and to see them using Linux for it. There's a lot that's of commercial cool. solutions out there, but that's the one I hope takes off. That's really awesome, and yeah. I love the over the air stuff versus the over the paper. Yeah, no you kidding. Know? A little push notification to your screen. Now your car can receive push notifications. Hey, I want to push you to try something. That's DigitalOcean. And trust me, it's worth it. Head over to DigitalOcean.com right now and find out why Matt and I rock a few droplets for different things. It's awesome. So what is DigitalOcean? Think of it like this, my friends. Simple cloud hosting. That's right. Dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up your own cloud server that you get root Dizzle access to. Users can create a cloud server in less than 55 seconds and pricing plans start at only 5 dollars a month that gets you 512 megabytes of ram a 20 gigabyte ssd one cpu and a terabyte of blazing fast transfer because DigitalOcean's got dim data centers all over the world in new york san francisco singapore amsterdam and in london their interface is simple so intuitive the control panel is honestly one of it's the benchmark it's the best control panel in the industry for any service and i don't mean like for vps's i mean for any service on the web, it's all HTML5. It all dynamically resizes. It allows you to take advantage of KVM, DNS management, snapshots, one-click deployments, Docker, migrate your machines across the world, private networking, all of it. And I'm just scratching the surface. It is incredible. And you can try it out for free for two months when you use our promo code last November. That's going to get you a $10 credit. You can try out the $5 rig two months. Just go experience this. Go deploy CoreOS. It's one of the coolest new server operating systems on the freaking planet, and you can try it out right now on a blazing fast DigitalOcean droplet. No better way to learn for two months for absolutely free when you use the promo code last November. But the best part, once you really get in, once you get invested and you're like, oh, this control panel, Chris was not kidding, but I don't have time to go to a web browser. I'm a busy guy. Well, good news. They have a straightforward API, which lots of developers are already writing tools for you, but you can also take advantage of it. Snap into your existing management infrastructure. Write a bash script, bro. I don't care. You can do whatever you want with that API. It is clean. It is smooth. Uh, we have a new show on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, and one of the uh, hosts on it, Paige, she tells me she's got a lot of stuff up on DigitalOcean, and she just writes all of it. She creates all of the machines, manages all the snapshots through the droplet in, or through the API. She doesn't even go to their interface. Now, I go to that interface because I like nice and shiny things, and I'm there all the time. But it's the flexibility it offers you, and the power is bar none the best. However, only the technology can only get you so far. At some point, you got to actually implement things. you got to know how to do things. And that's why DigitalOcean has the best tutorials on the web. And they're getting even better because they're willing to pay up to $200 if you write one for them. Yeah, that, that's how important this is to Good them. Good money. $200, and they'll even work with you with an editor, and they have a content editing position open right now as well. 
Uh, if you'd like to get in there and maybe help edit some of those, so head over to DigitalOcean.com. Use that promo code last November. Get that ten dollars credit. You just apply it to your account. So just boom. It's which I also really like. I really like yeah. the way their billing works too. It's like all of it, the oh, whole I, thing. I, the, what I love most about their billing is the fact that I, I a lot of times I'll just prepay stuff. Yeah, buddy. It's like oh, I got, I got money this week. Cool. Yep. I'm gonna throw some cash at that. I'll you know? toss oh, a little, like, a couple of yep. the extra PayPal dollars in there, right. and you know you can use our promo code last November to get you a ten dollars credit, and you can try it out for two months. Yep. That's pretty good. And their pricing structure is so straightforward. It's really easy when you want to step up and expand and they even offer hourly if you just need to sort of scale up for maybe a couple of hours right. it's an awesome way to go digitalocean.com go get some linux machines running on top of kvm powered by them ssd drives digitalocean.com last november when you check out that's right mm-hmm. so i i asked on on the tweeters last week i said hey what's an what's an app pick that we have not featured on the show mm. and uh, this next one isn't really my bag Okay, uh, but I okay. totally could see how it could be up the alley of a few of the uh, Linux Action Show audience members out there. It's mm-hmm. called Mock Music on Mock. Console. It's not that new. It was sent in by oh, that's pretty cool. By yeah. Kyle, yeah. He says Mock Music on Console. It's a lightweight and easy to use N Curses music player with a client server model. Way simpler than MPD. Now that client server model is kind of mm. neat. I'll come back to that in just a second. So it's Mock M O C, and okay. uh, it's M O C dot Dapper dot net. I got a link in the in the show notes okay. if you want to check it out. Take a look at it, Matt. What you do is you launch it in your console. It's NCurses based. You browse into the directory that has the music. You hit play, and it just automatically starts playing from wherever you selected in that directory. You got your standard options, your stereo, your volume control, your shuffles, your repeats. It also has a server component, though, where you can have an index up on the server and then connect to that and play that. That's uh, neat, right? Yes. So you got yes. limited SSD space, something like that. Right. And you can run this thing like on a Pi. It doesn't care. It's like, right. you know, yeah. you don't uh, have to worry about that silly album art. Or it's you know, also something. neat, like, if you have a central music server, you can SSH into mm-hmm. it and kick stuff off over its own speakers so i've got speakers hooked up to a nuck right now it's kind of a neat trick that's cool i you know the thing is is for me my music is is more streaming these days and Mm -hmm. when i do want to have my music i actually have just been playing it through vlc oh really i I hate to be that guy but like i've sort of pulled away from rhythm box and 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 just kind of gone like uh rhythm box is fine but and i tend to pandora or you know whatever i've got a pithos for linux users pithos Uh, is an awesome former pick Mm -hmm. that's my route too and the reason is is because usually when i'm listening to music it's when I've played through all my podcasts, and uh, yeah, exactly. I just want a little background noise, and right. so Pandora does that for me without any thinking. However, if I was seriously still into managing my music collection, which I might get into one day, yeah. uh, back into, I should say, this is a great way to go, and it's it just recently celebrated its 10th birthday, and there's, uh, it's still an active project. That's really cool, yeah, so I, and I think it's an important active project, because yeah. I think it fills a need. Yeah, uh, looks familiar in our IRC chat room says that uh, he often uses MPV for his music playback. Nice. I've been doing that, too. But I really, I really like... Uh, the idea of a full-featured music management terminal bass player. That is kind of neat. What was that Winamp clone that was so big, like, I don't know, oh, five, XMPP? six years ago? Was it yes, a, yeah, that, that was one I missed. Yeah. That was great because it was yeah. it was just light enough yeah. to do what I needed it to do. Mm-hmm. Runs a playlist. I, uh, um, I'm also with uh, Roasted in the chat room. My current, like, when I do go network-based, uh, I still have a subsonic installation. Oh, do you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I can play those in some of the different players. Subsonic, we've mm. talked about it before. It's sort of a more modern version of this where you have a web-based right. server. I can also, the other nice thing about Subsonic is I can have it manage my podcast centrally and stuff That's like nice. that, too. That's nice. That's yeah. nice. And I like Clementine, too, actually. That is my go-to. Oh, yeah, buddy. Bam. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. Uh, Clementine is great. Hey, just a quick reminder. We've got the uh, Jupiter.gift store up right now, the JB Polo. We've sold 45 of 100. I got the new uh, I got the new material. This is, it's a heavy kind of thick polo. I really like the way it sits I think it's very, very high quality. Uh, I'm, I am crazy, crazy excited about this polo. And Doesn't it's got, it have the uh, it's got the yeah. embroidered yeah, Jupiter Broadcasting yeah. logo on it. Also, back by popular demand, the uh, Linux Action Show uh, hooded jacket mm-hmm. is uh, it's it's met its goal and uh, it's shipping now. The ho- the polo has not met its goal yet. The jacket has, so you still have a chance to buy one. Uh, it'll be available until December first. I got mine down here at teespring.com slash JB jacket. Yeah, you do. Yeah. And uh, back people, people love it. People come and people are actually coming back and buying seconds. Oh, it's which the is best re- sweatshirt I've ever owned. Really cool. Really, yeah. yeah, it's super comfortable. Yeah. Again, good material. And the inside is really, really, really soft. It's great yeah. for a little bit of chilly weather. We've also got the Tech Talk Today hoodie and the Jupiter Broadcasting Kids Club shirt. Oh, we sold seven of the Tech Talk Today hoodies. That's great. Oh, wow. Cool. But if okay. you're going to, if you can only buy two, Get the polo and the jacket. Yeah, you know. I'm telling you. Pick the one you want to use. Yeah. That polo is, and and by the way, we have this uh, charcoal gray. Oh, yeah, that's the way to go. is amazing. Yeah, and the yeah. embroidered logo is going to look so sharp. 
uh, they've uh, Teespring's been really great working with us because I wanted to be really picky for this one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, they sent me a few proofs, and I I feel a little <laughs> spoiled. It's it's really great, and we also have uh, the ladies' version of the polo yeah. as well, which is uh, very nice. I like it a lot. So you can yeah. check that out at uh, Jupiter.gift for all of them. Very cool. And they'll be available just for a little bit longer because we want to get them out in time for the holidays. Oh, absolutely. So uh, I want to pick, in fact, I wonder if I can go find OMG Ubuntu this week did a really, really great write-up. And I, I, full disclaimer, and I have witnesses. I was already going to make this my pick <laughs> sure. before they wrote it up. I have witnesses. Uh, I, I've talked about it before in yeah. the show, so it's not our desktop app pick mock was. Right, right. This is our weekly spotlight. It's I, Sometimes okay. I want to revisit open source projects that have had significant improvements since we've talked to them on the Linux Action Show, sort Sounds of revisit worthwhile. them. This week, we got to talk about the best, I, I know I'm, I'm going to say it, <laughs> the best Twitter client. I said it. Wow. On any platform in the world. It's called Corebird, and it's available for Linux right now. It's a native GTK Twitter client, and it's amazing. It's real, and it's incredible. And it doesn't look ugly. I mean, that's no. unusual for a GTK no. uh, Twitter it app. Is, it is very, very well done. Uh, so yeah, here's some four key so improvements. Now you can switch switching between multiple accounts is way, way easier. The Compose box is much better. It works with it automatically will suggest hashtags and, uh, oh, yeah. and at mentions when you're filling those in, which is just a nice little to have. It's supported for multiple GIFs now. So you, And right. the image, oh, the way it displays images is so slick. I'll show you this in okay. a second. Uh, and, uh, of course, the interface has gotten a nice, beautiful refresh. It looks like the perfect modern GTK app application with the header bar there uh so it's a it's a it's a really solid effort i've been using it all week i've got it installed right here on my machine and uh i have it set up there's a, you have you have different options mm-hmm. i have it set up to sort of waterfall mode where it's always constantly updating so the, the list just scrolls for me oh, automatically that's nice. you, i want to show you here I like you, how they do the images that's great. you see how they're doing the image now when i when i when i tap the image and yeah. bring it up it expands it and oh, I yeah. tap it again and it goes away. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and uh, so I can pull up and it'll also do oh, videos wow. in line this way. So you can go in here and uh, you can you can drop down the menu. You can get and huh. if, you've got the ability to reply obviously in line right here. Pulls up the uh, the message. You can uh, click on the full conversations. Get great conversation threads. I love the way it displays that. Here's my at replies. All right here. So here's there's an app from Charlie right there. <laughs> That's uh, kind of cool. How he's like the little NSA guys like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I if I uh, like I can break yeah. this down and I can see the details of this. So if I had oh, so if I have okay. responses with people, I can see my messages in line to them. Here's the picture I tweeted out that he was replying to. So for the audio listeners, uh, when he clicks on a message, for example, it side scrolls deeper yeah. into the message, yeah. expands it up. That's really cool. All, all very subtle, very smooth animations. Yeah. As new tweets come in, it just very elegantly drops the tweet list down. I've been running this for about huh. five, six days at a time, and after about the sixth day or so, I get a, I get a core dump, and the application closes, and Uh-oh. then I relaunch. Um, not a not not a big deal. Okay. Twitter app is not mission critical. It's right. not a big deal, and that may be their API. Honestly, uh, and it's just you know I'm sure it'll get worked out, right? It's yeah. not a biggie. Uh, if you've got you can uh, you can go to all of your messages in here. Composing a message is really nice. It it is it's a very very well done uh, Twitter client. Mm-hmm. You can see here I have the dark theme I'm using. Of course, in the OMG Ubuntu article, they're showing you the light theme. Right. So right. it matches your GTK theming very well. That's nice. It does seem like it integrates very cleanly. You know, a lot mm-hmm. of times when you see uh, an app like this. That ties in with a blogging service or a, a social media service. A lot of times, it'll come. It'll it'll feel a little bit like a knockoff, right? Like it's right. copying the desktop app, or it's not native to Linux. Not only is this truly genuinely native to Linux, it feels like a first class Linux app. It feels like it's built and meant for the Linux desktop, but it's also just it's it's showcasing some really new and interesting, fun design elements that are unique to the GNOME desktop. So it's great to experience mm. it from that standpoint as well. So to have a, a first class Twitter client that is truly native that really is, ex- is experimenting and pushing the borders of what you can do with a no map. All of that in one package to me makes it extremely exciting. Now, it is a little difficult to get on non arch distributions at the ah, moment, right. but you can do it. And if you're a Twitter fan or anything like that, I'd highly recommend you try it out. I've been extremely happy with it. And I was following um, huh. news breaking events for some of our other shows via Twitter, and I could put in real time filters and watch just the conversations about these things. And it was a very That's valuable really cool. uh, 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 research tool as well. And it has full touch support. So if you do happen to have a touch screen, uh, you can do that. <laughs> I was wondering how that was going to slide in there. Yeah, That's it works cool. quite well. And I can maximize like that. I can pull it down. And uh, it's That's really cool. And of course, I can scroll right here in the uh, column yeah. as well. So it's called Corebird. We've talked about it a little bit before, but it's just gotten even better since we talked about it last. And uh, OMG Ubuntu just did a great write-up. I don't think, let me check the bottom of their article. I don't think they have a PPA. 
Uh, no, you don't. How to install it. So there's no official PPA, only source packages for you Ubuntu users. Okay. Uh, but uh, I bet you'll see a package soon. Well, in worst case scenario, you know, you get PPA manager, you do a search, it goes out to the PPA universe and it says, oh, hey, it's up now. Check yeah, you'll, and you just find yeah. it. Uh, it's easy. Uh, so and, and Joey in here in the article says, if you or someone you know fancies making a deb uh, or sending a PPA, please let us know. Yeah, that, and it'll happen. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Cold but Arch will have it first, just because they're much more a much more bleeding edge. Situation. Oh, in fact, WWNSX is in the comments. If you scroll down, you'll actually find somebody posted a PPA. So there you go. There you go. I told yeah. you it happened fast. Yeah. Uh, it's Boom. Core Bird. It is. Uh, yes, it's just a Twitter client, but at the same time. It's also a microcosm of everything I'm loving about the GNOME yeah. desktop right now in terms of design and pushing the edge. And doesn't mean it's perfect, no. But it means they're doing something really cool and interesting. Well, and when you it, can comes, check it out. comes to getting coverage, I think Twitter has a really great purpose there because it allows you to kind of filter through a lot of nonsense yeah. and, and really get the nuggets of truth yep. or information you're looking for. And for me, so. I don't have um, I don't have live TV at home. So sometimes yeah. the way I follow late breaking events is either finding a stream mm -hmm. or by following Twitter. Yeah. Depending on what true. it is, you know. And so Corebird, having this up on my screen, just going all day long. Um, I felt like it was a very useful tool nice. and really impressed by it. And you can see they even support the uh, uh, the new GTK popovers, which look great. Uh, you can see that right there. It's just oh yeah, see that it app. does look really sharp. Yeah, it's a great really app. sharp. And I, it's been fun to play with it while I've been using Touch as well, which I'll tell you more about in the feedback <laughs> segment. Yeah. You're having fun. We got a lot to cover today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's do the news. <laughs> Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Hey, everybody, go to last.ting.com right now. Last.ting.com. Let's do it. Let's check them out, and you'll also save $25 on your next Ting device. I just pulled out. I was just charging before the show because I let my battery. I didn't plug it in last night. Oh, no. Don't you I got, that? I got Android L, and uh, I got it on the Nexus 5, and I got it on the <laughs> Ting network. And I'm not on the Nexus 5, but yeah, I'm yeah. coming on two years now on Ting. I started with an Evo. I brought my Evo 4G over to Ting. That gave me $25 of credit. That got me through, like, almost two months, I think, Oh, wow. Ting. And then since yeah. then, I've added three more devices, and it's rad. In fact, I've never once had to even called customers customer support to activate a device because they can do it all with their control panel, even though they have no yeah. whole customer service. That's great. I've never had to take advantage of it. But I, I, I rest comfortably knowing friends and family I've switched over to Ting can take and do take advantage of it. So go to last.ting.com. That'll save $25 off your Ting device. If you got a compatible one, they'll give you a $25 credit. Now, here's what's great about Ting. You only pay for what you use. Ting takes your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. They add them all up. Whatever bucket you follow, that's all you're going to pay. No contract, no early termination nope. fee. It's a flat $6 for that line, and then just your usage on top of it. So go over there right now. Try out their savings calculator. Plug in your information in there and see how much you might save. But also, I invite you to maybe think a little bit outside the box with Ting. Ting also doesn't mind if you want to use them as a mobile ISP. So if you go over to last.ting.com. I encourage you to check out some of their MiFi devices. They have incredible deals now on a few of them. You can also pick up your Nexus 6 SIM card if you're going to get a Nexus 6 on the Ting network. But look at this right here, Hawaii 5072. This is a MiFi hotspot. You can just put in your bag. $41. Nice. You own it outright, and then it's just $6. But you can also log into the Ting dashboard and just turn it off when you don't need it. That's right. It's it, like, need Wi-Fi? Boom, done. There yeah. You go. You're going to travel for a couple of days? Turn it on, then turn it off. It's awesome. They've got feature phones. They've got the iPhone. They've got the uh, boosters if you need a little better signal in your house. They've got, of course, the greatest Android phones. They've got... Now, this, if I was going to spend a little more, mm. and I think I would if I was going to be like, if I was in IT and I was going to use this on a serious basis, they got the Netgear Zing. It's a tri-band LTE wireless hotspot in your pocket. Tri-band LTE means that you get all three bands of LTE. You can use, if you have good signal in all three areas, that's three bands of LTE you can pull data over. I get 18 megabits right now in the studio because of tri-band LTE. Wow. But you could also just be in an area where there's maybe one, one band is stronger than the other. It can, it can jump onto that and get you a good solid signal. But the thing I really like about the Netgear Zing is this OLED screen where it yes. gives you your signal, how much data you've used. You can turn the Wi-Fi and manage it. You can set the passwords. It gives you alerts. It gives you the Wi-Fi password right there on the screen if you need it. It makes it so simple to use. You can have up to 10 devices connected to it. You could have it by Monday. $140 shipped. $6 for when you have it active. That is so awesome. No contract. Up to 10 devices. When you need tri-band LTE mm. on the go, you turn it on. And it's just your usage at, after that. <laughs> Isn't that a neat deal? That is so, so cool. So many great devices over at Ting you can check out. And Kyra's here this week with another great app pick, mm. Matt. Are you ready? All ready. Let's roll it out, Kyra. What you got? Looking for a place to live but not sure if you're ready to commit? 
I'm Kyra, and this Ting's App of the Week. That sounds like me. Hi. <laughs> Doorstep Swipe is the Tinder of the real estate world. Basically, you get presented a bunch of housing options, and you say whether you like them or not. It's pretty simple, and it's a much less intimidating way to start seeing what's out there in terms of real estate. No need to engage with a real estate agent or start going to open houses. Just see a bunch of potential places and react to them. Start out with some basic data about where you're looking to buy. That's cool. Set your price oh, limit. How many bedrooms? Not, where was that a few years ago? Swipe Gosh, right really? to save a property. Swipe left to say thanks, but no thanks. Wow. It's like Tap an image to get some more detail cool. on the place in question. That's like as easy as it could be. Swipe through the available images here. Tap in the top left to get some more detailed settings. Sale filters let you set your minimum and maximum price, number of bedrooms, and square footage. Going into your swipe summary, you can see some data on the types of houses you've shown interest in. That's neat. If you're that's seeing an so average cool. price of half a million and you're working with a budget of 200000 that's what we in the real estate business call a bit of a problem. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Go, Kyra. Hit that like button, definitely. Like you can find their YouTube channel. Also, follow them on Twitter, at TingFTW. That was cool. And uh, check them out at last.ting.com. So so that app, what it really is, is they've taken the Tinder. Have you ever seen the Tinder app? It's like yes. a dating app where you swipe through people. They've taken that to housing, and then you can set up a whole bunch of filters. Wow. I, how come that's been uh, doorsteps? That I, I want. I, I could have used that. I mean, like, I think it's kind of it's kind of messed up when you're doing it with people. But I think with houses, yeah. it's okay. Way yeah. better. Yeah, Way yeah, better. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to make make your dating selections with. Uh, app, also, but. just uh, one last quick little note about yeah. Ting, and then we'll move on because uh, I think you guys get the idea. But uh, Consumer Reports uh, just did a customer survey of Ting customers. This all so actually, cool. all cell phone customers. Uh, and, and this is the one that really matters because it's people who are using the service and they don't just like send them like a questionnaire. They go out and do interviews with these people and talk to them. And this is Consumer Reports. And they came back and rated Ting way up there on customer satisfaction. I, I have to read the report, but I think they might have been on the very top. No so surprise. Really awesome. Last.ting.com to get started. Find out why Matt and I have been so happy and so many Linux Whoop. Action Show audience members. Matt, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about getting Linux on different devices, how yes. Android is totally dominant in the tablet space, and of course iOS as well. It certainly feels that way. Well, there's a new contender in town, and it's the Yala tablet. Ooh. You might be thinking of Yala as that phone company that makes Sailfish OS that I run right here on my Nexus from time to time, but no, my friends... With Sailfish 2.0 debuting, this is going to be a crowdsourced tablet from the Yala folks. they got a crowdfunding video here. It's up on Indiegogo. It's already seen phenomenal success. In fact, to celebrate, the Yala tablet's people-powered $1 million uh, crowdfunding mark. They just tweeted out they're offering crazy prices on the phones. You can find it at shop.yala.com, J-O-L-L-A.com. But, Matt, this video to me, it I, I don't know, it, it struck me. I want to play a little bit of yeah, a crowdfunding video. And uh, so you guys can see sort of how serious they are about this. I think it's pretty inspiring. Yola is here to change the tech world into a better and more open place. In only three years, Yola's developed an operating system called Sailfish, hired over 100 people, and designed a UI which is unlike any other. We've put our hearts and souls into Yola, and the great news is the hard work is paying off. We're now selling in 31 countries and counting. Come on inside. I have something new to show you. Now it's my pleasure to present to you plans for our next product, the Yola tablet. It actually looks really well designed. Yeah, it does. And uh, I, as a Sailfish OS user on the Nexus 5, I've always felt that it was meant for a tablet. It felt a little constrained. It's just a dream, but we want to make it a reality. We want the tablet to be people-powered by the Yola community. You tell us what you want, and we'll do everything we can. Isn't that a great-looking hardware? That is really good. It's very tight. Your tablet is powered by open-source software called the Sailfish. The Yola tablet's display is as high-end as you'll find today. You're going to love it. 330 believe PPI screen. Designed is beautiful. Designed so the front in of Finland. your tablet doesn't have any unnecessary buttons. The Sailfish operating system works with natural hand movements via gestures. The multitasking on the Selfish operating system shows all your running apps conveniently in one single view. Oh, that's cool. And Selfish runs the Android apps. And feel of your oh, that's to okay. match your mood with the ambiance <laughs> switcher. Fits Please in one hand easily. Campaign. Join the YOLA movement. Join our community. Let's show nice the big companies that independence, innovation, and people matter. 
but it takes money and we need your help. Yola is completely different than any other company you could support. We're powered by people. All of our customers have a say in what goes into our products. Please help us make the Yola tablet and make it yours. One, two, three. People power! It does look a little bit like one of the Southern ones, actually. Yeah, just a touch. It's, uh, I don't know, I think it's kind of an exciting uh, initiative to see a uh, Linux-based device that doesn't have a big name like Google or Apple behind it uh, get such massive response. Yeah. Um, well, I think the presentation helped. I think they did yeah. a nice job with one both of the point, video and the website. Almost 1.2 million raised. Wow. Back. Well, and they immediately had a you know kind of a, a flow to the why you care. I mean, it really the entire yeah. the entire experience flowed really nicely. They're already at three hundred and thirteen percent funding with seventeen days left. And you were telling me that you can run Android apps. I mean, yeah. apparently even paid Android apps. Yeah, I, I don't know if the Play API works or exactly. I mean, maybe the audience yeah. could fill us in. But yeah, you can run because there's that Android. Helps. There's a, they have the Davlik virtual machine on there. Right. I think it's essentially that. And wow. uh, you can run it. The hardware looks exceptional. Yes. Uh, of course, I, I really support the group's work. It's going to have a GPS in there. It has a micro SD slot that supports up to 32 gigabytes. Uh, it's got uh, 80211 A, B, N, G, and N built in, 4,300 milliamp battery. So the battery life is probably going to be pretty impressive. That helps. That 7. helps 7.85 inch IPS display. Hmm. The resolution 2040 by 1536. And it's, like I said earlier, 330 PPI screen, yeah. 1080p video, 1.8 gigahertz quad core processor, two gigabytes of RAM. This is a serious, legitimate, well designed, well specced tablet running Linux. Man. Well, and I think that the battery life might be getting some benefit from the fact that it's not dealing with all the Android. Maybe crap so. In yeah. The background. That's yeah, just maybe a guess. So. So uh, congratulations to the Yala team, and we'll have a link in the show notes if you'd like to get in and funding on that. Some of the funding levels do include hardware. That Speaking would help. of funding, no. I think ever it's no secret that uh, Mozilla has received, uh, I believe, up to eighty-five percent of its past funding from its search deal with Google. Eighty-five percent with a search go- deal with wow. Google. So that's why when Mozilla announced it was ending its ten-year partnership. It was kind of a big deal. Yeah. And the way they're doing it is kind of interesting. In fact, it hasn't gotten a lot of play, but Google's not out entirely. In, uh, I, believe in, I believe in some areas, uh, Firefox is still shipping with Google integrated. But since 2004, Google has been paying Mozilla a ton of money each year, an estimated around $100 million for the privilege of being the default search engine used in Firefox. It represented the lion's share of Mozilla's income with the ballpark of 85%. That deal was renewed in 2011. We talked about it then. It's come to an end, and this time it's not going to be renewed. Mozilla announced today that the free browser vendor is switching to a range of different search providers. In the U.S., Firefox will default to using Yahoo. Uh, In Russia, it'll use Yannix, and in China, Baidu. Mozilla and Yahoo have signed a five-year deal. As part of the deal, Yahoo is going to start honoring the Do Not Track feature when used by Firefox users to limit Yahoo's ability to track them. That's good. Yeah. And Yahoo is also designing a new ser- custom search page for American Firefox users, which we'll probably see in about December. No details on the financial terms. See, that's the part I want to know about because it's like they better be getting a buttload from Yahoo because Yahoo is sucks. just – Oh, that's being kind. Mm-hmm. That's that's disrespectful to sucks. Yeah. I yeah. mean it's horrible. I think people in our community would have much, much rather seen DuckDuckGo. Yeah, but, that would have made sense. And and this is an interesting thing because if uh, – I mean it seems if Firefox – or I'm sorry, the Mozilla Foundation was truly about protecting users, security, and privacy, they probably would have, regardless of the funding – Maybe opted for DuckDuckGo. I'm I'm assuming the reason Yahoo was selected is simply because Yahoo has the pockets deep enough to at least somewhat match probably what Google was paying, right? I'm sure. Yeah. There's... Well, and then also the fact that a lot of people don't really stop and realize Mozilla is two entities. You have the Mozilla Inc. and you have the Mo- Mozilla Org. And Mozilla Inc. cares about the Inc.'s got to do what yeah, Inc.'s got to do. Gotta, it's about the Benjamins. So, you know, and, and a lot of times they do mm-hmm. influence, make decisions for the org. So, you know, there is that factor. And I think the money definitely plays a big part in it. And I suspect Yahoo, you know, Melissa's probably throwing some cash, you know, their way. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is her name? Meli- I just want to I just no, Melissa. I can't not, remember her last name. Melissa. No, it's Meyer. It's something. Meyer. Yeah, Melissa Meyer, I think. No, is it Melissa? Meyer? No. Boy, yeah. the chat room will tell us. It's... <laughs> It's not well, that. But anyway, I know the, what you're uh, saying. The Yahoo head, you know, is uh, throwing some cash down. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Marissa. 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 I was, Marissa. Yeah, I was close. Mm-hmm. I was you close. were. That's why I was I had hard an to ex get. named Melissa, so, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Does she work at uh, Yahoo? No. Okay. I doubt <laughs> <laughs> You'd be kicking yourself if she did right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding, right? Uh, oh all right. God. So while we're on the uh, topic of crowdfunding, 
I don't know what to make of this. It's a it's a laptop okay. that promises to respect your essential freedoms. It's called the Purism, the company behind it, hmm. and they're launching the laptop called Librem. It's a 15-inch, nearly free of proprietary code laptop. Here's the design of it. Oh, wow. It's not it echoes terrible. back to a MacBook Pro with a large trackpad, all metal case. good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it starts at different price ranges. Uh, Purism is launching this on Crowd Supply. The idea is it's going to give you a laptop where you don't have to run any proprietary hmm. drivers and no binary blobs in your distro. It's based on an Intel i7 4712MQ processor, 15.6 inch screen, 4 gigabytes of RAM, and a 4 gigabyte spinning hard drive, although you can tweak these things. Uh, right. Three USB 3.0 ports, HDMI out, uh, an expansion uh, SD card slot, and a pop-down RJ45 gigabit adapter, as well as wow. a Theros-based 802.11 and Wi-Fi, 720p webcam, HD audio, and a backlit keyboard. And it will be coming preloaded with Trisco Linux. Gosh, you know, I got to tell you, if the Free Software Foundation doesn't absolutely throw themselves like at this as hard as they can, they need to just pack it up and go home. Well, because th this is you know. there's a couple of gotchas. Oh, okay. okay. And the only reason I even bring these up right, is right. because this thing does pitch itself as the laptop that respects your essential yeah, freedoms. That's so it's cost. That's yeah. Uh, so why don't you know? I'll play a little bit of the video, okay. just a little okay. bit, and then we'll I'll tell that. you about some of the downsides that yeah. kind of have me scratching my head just a little bit. And it might be fine, yeah. yeah we'll but see. We'll it, see. there are questions that need to be raised. Yeah. Imagine a high-end laptop manufactured to respect your privacy and protect your freedom. Would you want a beautiful laptop where every single chip was hand-selected to run free and open-source software, so you know what it does? What if you could buy a laptop that was truly owned by you? and not by corporations installing proprietary software or monitoring your personal information for their profit. Wouldn't it be great to have high quality hardware manufactured specifically to respect your essential freedoms? Introducing the Librem 15 laptop by Purism. This is the first high-end laptop where you are in control and have complete visibility into the kernel, the operating system, and all software. Meticulously designed chip by chip to work with free and open source software. The Librem reinstates your rights to freedom and privacy. All right, so okay. a design chip by chip. They're to respect really pushing your that whole free, yeah. yeah. Okay. So here's the, and this doesn't bother me, but this is kind of. Now, and mind you, they're going for a Triscoll, you know, yeah. situation. So, so they're. Curious. I think, you know, I think this is a, I think this is a really interesting initiative, and I'm, I'm a big believer in getting really well designed hardware to work mm -hmm. well with Linux. I think it's pretty important. I think it's more important than a lot of people give it credit for. Uh, and let's just look at, you know, real quick here, we're looking at the starting price, uh, early adopter, 1500 1449 you get four gigabytes of RAM, 500 yep. gigabyte SSD, and the i7 CPU. Uh, but here's the things that jumped out at me when they're talking about every chip has been hand-picked to, to be free. Uh, a couple of gotchas, though. Okay. Um, first of all, I consider this to be a pro, but it ships with an NVIDIA card. Yeah, that's not, yeah, yeah. And that's the way a... their answer to that is, well, we'll use the free open source driver. <sighs> okay. <laughs> uh, and you know, I mean, if they can do it successfully and back it up, awesome. It I also mean, has an Intel graphics but, card in it. Yeah, because uh, that'll happen. But in, in video, here's the other thing, mm. and and this again, not a big deal, but it does have another area that's not exactly open and free. Um, it has a core boot uh, BIOS in it, and uh, that's fine. Except for here, I'll read it. They, I'll say it the way they say it. Uh, uh, oh, it's not in this part. Uh, they say that they are working to get Intel to open that up. Yeah, here we go. See, those, oh, he says, through the bootloader, Linux kernel, and GNU OS, all software and applications are completely free and libre uh, without any binary blobs. The BIOS, however, does use core boot, which includes a binary from Intel called FSP. He's got a diagram with the components, which, which parts are free and libre and which aren't. So he's right. breaking it all down really specifically. We're working with Intel to allow us to scrub and release and maintain the source for this, but haven't finalized that yet. We're devoted to freeing this binary. You can read about the current state of our efforts to free the BIOS here. So you've got you've got Boy. an NVIDIA card and a binary blob for the BIOS and a machine that supposedly every chip has been hand-picked. So here's the problem, and I realize why they're doing this before they finalize with Intel because they, quite honestly, they need leverage. But the problem is is that they need to actually have a, you know, like say, okay, Q1 2015. They need, they need some sort of a timeline for people to take this seriously mm. as being resolved. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it's another, hey, we're going to port this we're game to Linux this, yeah. after we get our funding, and then yeah. we're going to screw you. Right. And we don't want that. So, uh, And uh, so for me... The NVIDIA is actually a plus because if I'm going to spend money right. on a computer, I want an actual big boy graphics that can right. do actual big boy games. And so I'll install the proprietary driver and I will play my video games right. because this right. is a tool for me. Sure. It's not a house. 
It's not a car. <laughs> it's not an heirloom I'm going to hand down for generations. You mean you're not living in an open source school bus? I, right. It's, it is a tool, <laughs> like... and one of the things I use that tool for yeah. is to play video games. Right. And as long as it does that, I'm happy. If it doesn't do that, I'm not going to buy it. Right. So you don't get a sell unless it has an NVIDIA card in it. So for me... I like the fact that you could use the open source binary or the uh, open source Navu driver if you want, or grab the proprietary binary blob. To me, that's a good thing, and I couldn't care less about the CoreOS blob either. Again, right, right. for me, computers are a temporary thing. I don't put them under glass after I've used them and put them up in the family museum and then bring <laughs> the next future generations of Fishers right. at the altar of my laptop and and protesticize about how all of the blobs on it are free and there's no proprietary no I don't that's not important to me right. but I'm not saying if it's important to you that's a bad thing this might not be the laptop for you and that's where it seems to be such a disconnect because they seem to me to be going after the Trisco base the GNU you know the people that say GNU slash Linux but yet then sticking it with an NVIDIA card and, and all of yeah. that it seems a little odd and I don't know if the pricing is very right because again, it's it's not exactly the most modern machine. Well, now this, now if you're familiar with any of the like really the GNU friendly uh, laptops, usually they're shaped like a cinder block and they have a one hour battery life yeah. and and five hundred twelve right. megabytes of RAM. They're saying potentially they're, they're, they're eight pretty, hours. So yeah, this is eight. this is actually the best. GNU friendly, you know, laptop I've ever seen as far as going with the Triscoll type operating system. Now, you know, that being said. You know, fifteen hundred bucks. That you're definitely a niche market. Yeah. You're definitely. Yeah. Th you're, this is addressing especially a niche. when it's yeah. four gigs and spinning platter. At, yes. At, at that. But again, I get it. I've played with the. You know, I've played with the. Uh, you know, the no blob distros, and they're cool. I, I can definitely see the appeal there. But at the same time, you know, we got to be realistic. We here's, need we need estimates on what's going on with the Intel situation. Here's yes, but you see, here's where this this yeah. what this laptop. Here's the checkbox that this laptop checks for me. Yeah. Am I almost guaranteed to have a hassle-free, out-of-the-ISO experience with almost any distro I pick? No. I think it could be. You think? If you're, if you're shipping it with Triscoll and it's... it's oh, well, you, no, that's true. You've got okay. the NVIDIA, you've yeah. got the open-source NVIDIA yeah. driver, so if you want to use that, you okay. could. I think this could be a laptop that is, seriously, you set it up and everything just works for you. Right. I think. So, I don't know. Here's the details. Yeah. Right now, they've raised $38,000 of $250,000. They have 38 days left, 15% funded, 48 pledges. I decided to back it last night. Oh, nice! Well done. Okay. Because I want to see if so. This is so you yeah. see. This is the question: Is I believe I really fundamentally believe in hardware that's meant to be used with Linux, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in and I think people don't place enough value, even if you're using off-the-shelf parts. Right. If somebody is curating those parts and putting them, assembling them into something that they have tested and made to work with Linux. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So to me, that is a very that is value added, and I I want to put my money where, I, where my mouth is and see if people building machines like this truly makes a difference. The specs, you know, I put an SSD in there and I up to eight gigs of RAM, which is the max. Yeah. Um, but you know, specs wise, I'll probably use it for a little while and then give it to my son right. uh, if they ship. And I figure if they do ship, we'll have a review unit here on the Linux Action Show. And we can tell you if it's really truly you know the perfect Linux laptop. It seems like a long shot. But I like the idea of something MacBook Airish that's yeah. metal, that has yeah, a 1080p screen. It doesn't feel yeah, it doesn't feel janky. Yeah, you know? it's, it's actually surprisingly Linux, good, right? Yeah. So for that, I'm willing to give it a shot. I may never even get it. We'll see. And yeah. if I do get it, well, I'll at least give it a review. <laughs> I don't know. All right, uh, let's just talk a little rumors before we get out of the news segment. Uh, there is perhaps going to be a press release or announcement or a, some kind of press event hmm. early next week. From BQ, the folks rumored to be working on the first official Ubuntu Touch phone. Now, it doesn't mean that this press event has anything to do with Ubuntu Touch. Let's see, it's going to be on the uh, the 25th, so that's on Tuesday. Right. So we might know by the time we're doing Linux Unplugged, so we could do an update in Linux Unplugged. So that they say BQ plans to announce three new products on November 25th. There's a lot of uh, speculation that they're going to announce the Aquarius E4.5 with Ubuntu Touch. Interesting. Now, Interesting. I almost hope this isn't true, though. Uh, here's the specs of this phone. You know, we just talked about the Yala tablet and what right. a rock star that is. Right. So uh, this is a 4.5-inch screen. Not bad. No. But okay. the resolution, 540 by 960. Uh, 1.3 gigahertz quad A7 MediaTek CPU, which is pretty low rent. Yeah. Uh, and a Mali 400 GPU at 500 megahertz. Again, MediaTek. To put that in perspective, right. now, I don't... I'm not an ARM processor expert by any means. I do know that those are the processors that ship in like the super cheap like 
fifty, eighty dollar Android tablets. They're not right. Awesome. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, two hundred two uh, one gigabyte of RAM, twenty one fifty milliamp battery, dual micro SIM slot, so you could uh, have multiple carriers in there. Definitely a pretty solid device. What I'm not clear on if it's I guess it's probably more compelling than the Nexus Four, which you could use today with Ubuntu Touch. You could. So I think it's probably more compelling than that. But it's not a rock star phone. It's a it's good. But I think that means you might have a pretty palatable price point. Well, and that's what I was gonna say. Now, if they're aiming to compete with say like Firefox phone, okay, you know that makes sense. The specs, yeah, they jive. Yeah, you know, actually quite competitive actually. So yeah. that's fine. Yeah. But if you're trying to compete with say like the Nexus or one of the higher end phones, no, that's right. not gonna happen. Right. No. Nope. And, and it, you know what though, in terms of getting mass market nope. share, that might be the better strategy because then you have the high end users like us that can go out and get the Nexus fives right. and port it ourselves or have yeah. some, somebody in the community port it. So uh, we may have an Ubuntu f- the first official Ubuntu phone announcement. Now, there are big questions that remain. Are we actually going to see it ship in 2014? Yeah. Uh, I believe there was a quote from a BQ executive who says that he feels like it's uh, more ready for a 2015 kind of thing. Uh, the deputy manager of BQ, he says in a recent interview with a Spanish website, El Confidencial, if he was asked about how the Ubuntu phone was coming along, and uh, Joey has summarized it here, and he says... We set a date of Ubuntu 2014, but I think 2015 is a more realistic figure. That's tough because you're missing out on, you know, the, the, the whole holiday yeah. scene. And, you know, even though it's a lower spec phone, you know, the, the, uh, that's too bad. But, you know, if that's the case, then maybe at this point you might as well wait till Q3, Q4, 2015. Yeah. And just do it right. And, I don't know. Uh, I'm also willing to be wrong about, like, you know, the thing is, is a lot of times when we look at these specs, yeah. we think of them in the context of Android. Well, Android is a big, heavy pig, okay? Right. So you need a lot of RAM, and you need a lot of brand-new yes. processor, but if you have a more optimized operating system that maybe isn't running a virtual machine all the time, you can get by with a, with a, maybe a slightly different processor and different amount of memory. So it, yeah. I think, you know, we got to wait to see it. It might actually surprisingly be good. Well, and I think the way they need to start doing this, too, is, you know, the specs are important, you know, as far as being listed. But I think when you guys are, you know, and, and this is going out to the guys that do the phone stuff for Ubuntu, when you guys are presenting this stuff, the very, very first thing it should be at the very top of that page after the title is usage video. I want to see mm-hmm. how this thing's used, then spec me. And the reason for that is... So how well cr- it worked with the Yala one, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and more importantly, you know, as Chris pointed out, the specs may not be that big of a deal depending on how it operates. If you can show why this is actually not a problem, the specs don't frighten me off as much. Good point. Just saying. Yeah, and they and so we may see them attempt to do that on yep. the twenty fifth when we should see the announcement. We might not see anything. This could be yeah. a complete these could be another set of Android phones. But everybody's watching BQ real closely right now because we were said, you know, we're gonna have an announcement soon. So anytime they like just fart a little bit, everybody's does that smell like Ubuntu? No. Get no. those cups away from your butt. They yeah. could be coming out with a whole new line of lollipop pop devices. I mean, we that really don't be. know. You don't know. So don't. Well, we'll keep an eye on the story. It's it's just, it's in that fun, like, stage where it's rumors mm-hmm. and, and and suppositions, and it's it almost yeah. feels like an Apple device launch a little bit when you're talking about iPhones and iPads and, and rumored specs and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's fun to see that kind of energy but, around. Uh, but I'm serious, guys. Before you guys start pushing out these specs and stuff, c- come talk to me first so we can get something out there that doesn't make people yep. do what they're doing in the chat room right now. You should now, start up a, uh, you, you should know. go in the, the Matt Hartley uh, marketing Ugh, consulting firm. God, I, yeah, then they're done that. Helping you <laughs> prevent a train wreck. Uh, Contact us at be, jupiterbroadcasting.com. Yeah, used to be called in for the uh, after the train wreck. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the cleanup fix, guy. I, I'm the guy. And in now the, you're like, please, call yeah. me before the wreck. Yeah, please. that would be nice because it's not fun. So. <laughs> all right, Matt, that's all the news for this week. Our next guest on the Linux Action Show is someone I've really been looking forward to talking to. We actually highlighted their project towards the beginning of the year in the Linux Action Show during our Runs Linux segment. And it resonates closely with me because I used to work in a school district IT department, and this was an initiative I attempted to pull off. So I can't wait to bring Charlie on to talk to him about what he's done at Penn Manor High School. But first, I want to thank our segment sponsor, and that's System76, Creators of Machines, Born to run Linux, and now with lifetime Ubuntu support. And uh, today's Linux Action Show, the Bonobo is doing something, Matt, I never even (laughs) thought I would be doing off of a laptop. I'm running not one display, like the built-in display, not two displays, like the capture to our Wirecast machine. No, no. Three displays currently oh. running off the Bonobo for this week's episode. Huh. I got HDMI used. I got the inbuilt uh, display in use and DisplayPort out driving this touchscreen monitor. That is crazy. 
Yeah, it's really awesome. And it shows you even a couple-year-old machine, you can still rock it. And the plug-it-in and just go nature of it, like, I didn't have any trouble configuring three monitors off the back of this thing. And that's how all their systems are, from laptops to desktop. System76 has hardware that runs with Linux. You have to just try it to see it. It really is impressive how easy it is, regardless of the distribution you use. System76.com. Go get yourself something nice and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. All right, Matt, I am super happy to welcome Charlie Reisinger to the show. Charlie, welcome to Linux Action Show. Thanks so much, gentlemen. I'm so thrilled to be here today. So uh, you are an IT director for Penn Manor School District, correct? That's correct. And the, That's uh, and the thing that you kind of been uh, getting your name out there for is this one-to-one program at the high school where, uh, now correct me if I'm wrong, but every high school student now has a Linux laptop, all of them? That's correct. Every one of our, um, currently our student population is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1,700 students, and everyone is currently carrying a uh, Linux laptop as part of our uh, school one-to-one program. And uh, at the end of the day, that's kind of, uh, I mean, as an IT director, that's a lot of people running a very powerful operating system on your network. So I, I want to get into all of these different aspects of it. I'm, sure, I'm sure. very fascinated by it. Uh, just really briefly, Charlie, my background, I got started um, in IT when I was a sophomore junior in high school. And uh, it was the IT director and uh, computer sciences teacher at the time that trusted me to give me root and administrative access to the entire network and essentially brought me in as part of their IT team. You know, and full-fledged responsibility, full access to the help desk, resolving tickets, deploying machines, all of this. And I, I have zero doubt that it was key to me going right into the IT field, just right out of school. You know, uh, I, I literally, the day I graduated, I walked away from the school, got in my car, and drove to my, to my next job, which was in IT. Cool. And it was critical, I think, to my career path. So when I watch what you're doing at a large scale like this, uh, it's, it's very exciting for me to see. And so could you recap kind of briefly what's been going on? It started, what, in about 2012, am I right, or 2013? And now we, here we are in 2014. It's obviously been in production for a while. Could you just give us a brief history of what's sure. been going on and what the program sure. is? Absolutely. And uh, before I do that, I, I want to make sure we come back to the concept of trust, because you mentioned that. You, you yeah. said early on in your, in your career, uh, you had a teacher, you had a guide, a facilitator that trusted you with the keys to mm -hmm. the IT kingdom. Yes, for sure. And I think that that's something that most schools fail to do with our kids. Um, you know, and, and I think there's a lesson in there that, that we all need to take away with it for, for education. But we'll, we'll come back to that yeah, in a absolutely. second. Yeah, absolutely. You bet. We, um, we've actually been a, an open source, a Linux district for well over a decade. Um, we have historically, um, you know, run Linux on, on the back end wherever we could, um, you know, from our servers. We started early days just like many people did with, you know, Apache here and some other open source solutions on our server. Yeah. And over the years that has grown through WordPress and Moodle and Koha and now our, our latest large scale implementation is OwnCloud. So we've always had it on the back end. Um, but really, it's 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 only been the past four to five years or so that we've been looking at this very seriously as a as a student solution. Um, actually, our our one to one began, believe it or not, at the elementary level. Mm. Uh, several years ago, we were uh, butting up against the end of life of our of our MacBooks. Um, you know, like many schools, you know, at Penn Manor, we had a number of um, of the the white MacBooks. Sure. You know, like our, 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 uh, the uh, MacBooks you're all familiar with. Yeah. And they were end of life. Um, the question was, you know, we had limited funds. How do we how do we replace them? And how do we provide as much computing to our students as as our as our budget would afford? So we took a big chance then, and we actually began converting the elementary labs. I'm sorry, the elementary carts. Uh, one lab began to roll out Linux at the elementary level. Um, we started with Zubuntu, uh, mm. running on 1204 um, you know, long-term support. And that's been in place for a number of years. And that has been very successful. Uh, we started initially with 600 units. Uh, we moved up to about 1,600 the following year. Awesome. And the experience that we gained, my team gained, in deploying and managing uh, those systems really really helped us build up to, to this large-scale deployment that uh, we did actually in January of this year. Okay. Um, so that, began... that was the high school, that deployment? That's correct. That yeah. was the high school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We uh, again just building from the experiences that we had at the elementary, and that was that was a big learning curve for us, not only from the technology side. And and I have a phenomenal team. And, and let me just stop for a, minute, a moment and say, uh, I could not accomplish this without my team. Um, they are incredibly hardworking. They're creative. They're clever. Um, they're phenomenal technologists, every one of them. But they also understand the mission of education. And, um, you know, again, without them, we just couldn't do this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this isn't just a Charlie initiative by any stretch of the imagination. This is really an IT team right. uh, initiative. 
And I have to also give equal credit to our teachers too, our administration, our principals, our school board, you know, for, for even trying something like this, because as you know, this is highly unusual in the field of education. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I would think in the field of edu- education these days, uh, the momentum would be behind a Chromebook, a Google Apps for Schools subscription, or maybe even something like a Office 365 subscription. In fact, when I, when I was thinking of this very problem, I thought today it would be even harder than it was when I was in high school because uh, back then there was these huge prices that you had to buy up front. And today it's, well, you don't have to spend all the money up front. What you do is you just subscribe and the student gets access. And to me, that seems almost like a more insidious form of lock-in in the school. So how did you fight against that momentum and that current? Because Chromebooks and, and software subscriptions, they must seem so attractive to a school district. Yeah, that's that's a really key point. So our, our initiative has has been, it, it's really uh, double double sides or two sides of the coin. Uh, it's a been obviously about providing the most technology for our kids, but it's also about keeping costs down. And you're right, right now the trend is for districts, for organizations to be locked into vendor subscriptions. Um, you mentioned, you know, Chromebooks, for example, they come with obviously a tie to Google, right, right. and to Google Apps. Yeah. And there's a cost involved in the management of those Chromebooks. Um, I think that, you know, with 365, especially now with the direction that Adobe is heading with a software subscription, mm-hmm. where districts or organizations never truly own the software, um, I, th- I think that stands in con- – I-, I don't think that's good for districts. I just right. don't think there's in any way that that's good for districts, not only from a financial standpoint, um, but also just from a practical standpoint where it, it doesn't allow yeah, – Adobe, I'll use again as an example. In-, in the old days, we would buy a version of the Creative Suite for our high school students and potentially hang on to that version for four or five years, right? Yeah. Uh, you four know, longer. how much has Photoshop – from an educational perspective, right, how much has Photoshop really changed – in four or five years. It, it hasn't. Mm-mm. So we could hang on to a version for a number of years. Um, but with Adobe's Creative Cloud, that creates a tremendous problem for school districts because now it's a subscription model. You know, I've run the numbers. We would be in, we would spend three, four, five times more on that software mm. um, and be handcuffed to it now forever. Char- Charlie, can I ask you, though, um, when I think, I mean, so... When I, the other counter-argument to what you just said is, okay, well, the cost might be higher. But here's the thing, Charlie. When my kid goes out in the business world, I want him to know how to use Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office because that's what he's going to use at his or she's going to use at her job. What's the counter argument to that? Because that was another thing that I think a lot of people go up against is, but these are the standard tools of the trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's and we hear that a lot. And you're right. That is a pretty standard counter argument. Uh, Typically, when when I'm having these conversations with parents, with members of the community, they're saying, well, why did you choose this path? You know, why is this the best path for my child? You know, oftentimes that'll be expressed in a question such as, well, in, in fact, I, I heard this as we were rolling out our high school one-to-one. Um, a member of the community said to me, this is phenomenal because now all of our students will learn how to use Excel. Yeah. And, you know, I said to this individual, I said, well, it's not about learning. You know, for years we've been trying to impress upon our teachers and our students. It's not about learning a specific application. It's about learning skills. What we want our students to be able to do is not necessarily use Excel We want them to be able to solve problems through spreadsheets. And that doesn't necessarily mean Excel or Google Docs or even LibreOffice. It means getting to the skill of can they think critically about crunching numbers or using a spreadsheet. And that's application agnostic. Mm -hmm. So for us, as we focus on the skill itself, really the the question of, of what we use then becomes the secondary question. Because it's the skill, the focus, it's the experience that the students have that's that's key. Charlie, one of my counter arguments also was always um, you can have like myself was you can have a very inquisitive student who really wants to go deep and really understand how these things work. And I don't know if that's as common as it used to be, but I got to believe it's still out there. And inherently, there's going to be a barrier at closed source software, commercial software, where you just cannot go deep enough. You can't go far enough. If you take the example of GIMP. If I was a student who was truly inquisitive enough, not only could I learn how to use the interface and understand the concepts of layers and brushes and all of this, but I could even go as deep as into the code, which is an, is is a layer of understanding of the computer and software that proprietary and commercial software can never offer. And it also seems like it's inherently beneficial to a school learning environment. So is this is this was this just a dream of mine, or is this something you've actually seen bear out in the students' interest of the systems? I think we're heading in that direction. Um, it, a couple examples of that. We've been, I've had conversation, uh, conversations with the folks uh, from LibreOffice, and we're trying to figure out ways to get our students involved in doing some level of development in LibreOffice. Now, 
it, mm. it, it's a code base that's probably deeper than what most high school sure. students will just will be able to build up but to. And that's, that's a pretty complicated something. project. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've had conversations with um, you know some folks about maybe Koha, you know, some of these yeah. other more accessible projects. But I think what's key to this is exactly what you described with with open source, with the ability to crack open the code and look inside of it. Students can participate in their own education and work on software that impacts their students. Mm. Um, for us last year, that bared out in a couple projects that that our kids assisted my team with. Um, one of our, our students uh, wrote a, an imaging system. He called it the Fast Linux Deployment Toolkit. Yeah. Uh, it's up on GitHub. You can check it out. You know, we, we made it available. Um, but that's a phenomenal example, right? Because that's a tool that in the end ended up impacting every single one of the kids in our high school. Um, you know, this student and his coding partner, um, they also build out the help desk software that, that their students used every day. These, I think, are more extreme examples um, because we had two very gifted students that were working on development of these programs, and that's, that's a bit of an anomaly um, because they were really on the high end. But I think even on you know, a, a much smaller step could be to get kids involved in triaging bugs, mm. uh, maybe writing documentation. Um, even submitting you know, feature requests to some of the open source projects. So I think that really touches upon what you're saying. Yeah. We would never be able to ask Adobe or no. Microsoft or Apple right, to be involved in their development process. And again, that's just one more way which kids are getting cut, cut out of technology. Mm -hmm. and, and I see that as problematic because, again, it turns them off from engineering and, and really diving deep into computers. You had an analogy that resonated really strongly with me. And it just was one of those things you just kind of said in, in, uh, in your TEDx talk, and it, after you said I just went, whoa. And that was that the software is quite literally now locked behind glass for the students. Like, literally, it is now behind glass, and you can touch it, but that's all you can do. And uh, that is not that is not conducive to a learning environment at all. You want to be able to tinker and take things apart and explore them, and or at least make it available when possible. So let's, let's go down that avenue a little bit. You mentioned it. Um, this is what got our attention in the Linux Action Show when we made it our Runs Linux. Is you had a student-developed Linux deployment kit that allowed you to mass image these laptops for the students. Can you tell us a little bit how it works, like some of the details and what it does? Sure, sure. And I will quickly go quickly go out of my technical slash development depth <laughs> as we discuss okay. this. So I'll give this you, as much I'll as you know, it's fine. Foot, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll give you the ten thousand foot view. Um, the problem that that we had, you know, for well, actually, it wasn't a problem. Of course, we could have gone. I guess, how do I want to approach this? There's two different. There's two different. Um, two different ways. The problem we had, of course, was how do we image 1,700 machines? Yeah. and How do we do that very rapidly? And, right? and consistently okay. too. Consistently, right? And yeah. that's not unique. Yeah. Um, I think part of that too is you know we could have solved that. We could have we could have purchased commercial software, but our student, um, his name's Andrew Lobos. Um, he's since graduated, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, he he came to my team and I and said, hey, I you know I'd like to begin playing around with this. You know, what if we wrote something? Um, Andrew worked with members of my team, um, Alex Lagunas and Chad Billman, two members of of, of the Penn Manor Tech team, and they came up with the FastLinks deployment kit. And I think what's really interesting about what Andrew's work is is. He took the building blocks and pieces of other open source projects and stitched them together to create something new. So there's UDP cast in there. There's part clone. Um, he was he was playing around with uh, Node.js at the end to create a little front end web panel to actually control the imaging process. And there must have been the back end infrastructure for it too, like a place for the server for it to sit on to send out yeah. to the machines a DD or something yeah. to write the image to the drive. I mean, that that is what you say though is extremely powerful because even if in open source you don't want to pull away the source code and look at the code, there's no disincentive for all the programs to just link together if you link them if you provide the glue. And so your student was able to go in there and just change all of these tools together and make something new. Yeah, that's. I think that's a really good point. You know, I've heard counter arguments to that saying, well, isn't this just great? Part of the problem with open source is that there's there's so much fragmentation and splintering of projects. You know, why didn't why didn't these students go out and try to build upon something else that was that was out there already and, and really add to the community? But I think that I think that misses the point of this being a true learning experience for the students. Um, and I and I think they did right. I mean, they took existing projects and they expanded it. Uh, but I think that's key. Again, it's the ability. It's it's what you said. It really, you know, the the, uh, the top of the hour, the top of the program. You know, your career was launched by having the ability and having somebody or a team of people that were mentors and they trusted you to go in with. You know, with within our case, within your case, these were servers and these were core tools that supported a building, a school, instruction. 
you know, somebody took it upon themselves to trust you to do that, and that's what we try to do with our students, you know, not just Andrew and his kit, but also with all of our student apprentices, you know, and really, ultimately, all of our students, we're, we're trusting them to, to do the right thing and to build something amazing. But uh, you actually, I mean, it's one thing, Charlie, to say you trust them, but you, uh, you actually give students root access to these machines, right? We do, we do. And that, initially, when we started talking about that, a lot of IT directors, a lot of colleagues in other districts were, were having heart attacks. I would imagine. Um, I, I had an initial <laughs> heart attack thinking, am I really doing this? Yeah. You know, we've had a lot of conversation with our community, with our parents, uh, you know, to explain our philosophy. Our principal, um, Dr. Philip Gale and I, um, we, we, we brought our students together at the beginning of the one-to-one -one program in assemblies, and we said to them, listen, we're giving you tremendous power. We're going to give you the ability to control your own machine. You know, of course, with that power comes responsibility, but we truly do trust you to do the right thing. Now, of course, we have policies mm -hmm. and, you know, we have an AUP and RUP that, that defines, you know, um, consequences, you know, if they step, you know, over the boundaries. And, and really that's written, though, from the perspective of, of making sure they're not doing anything illegal Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. on the network or with yeah. the machine. Yeah. But but really, our philosophy has been to to empower the student as much as possible. And again, that's scary because most educational models are completely opposite of that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's about control and handcuffing kids and making sure they only go down the paths right. that you know an administrator or principal an IT director says they should go down. Yeah. I mean, uh, the you know when I was. Uh... When when Windows was becoming large on the network and the and Active Directory was really starting to spin up and uh, group policy was getting more and more sophisticated, the, the discussion never was well how much access can we give the students. The discussion always was how can we manipulate group policy or network permissions or whatever to prevent this. Um, and of course, it never the students that were truly inspired to break it always broke it. It didn't fully work. And I would think. Uh, you also incorporate the students as part of the help desk process. So if a student breaks something with root access, doesn't that just sort of, quote unquote, give a student an assignment to go fix that problem too? Or is that how yeah. it works? Yeah, essentially. We, um, I, I'll tell you, it's funny because you would have the expectation that our kids would explore more than what they do. Mm. They don't, Yeah. which is, and, and I think there, that's a commentary for on, on, on a couple things. Yeah. So what, okay, so let me back up a second. So if a student does break something, they can certainly come down to our help desk and our kids will help them get back, back on, uh, back on the tracks. If they break it too badly, um, we can always plug it back into the fast links deployment toolkit and they'll get a fresh image and mm -hmm. off they go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's that experience. But what I'm finding, and, and outside of the uh, outside the help desk, there's, there's, and there's a little, there's a, there's a few sprouts here and there of kids that are exploring. But kids aren't diving as deep as what I thought they would initially. Yeah. And I think some of that, I think it, it will build over time. But I think some of that, again, is because perhaps they, they've grown up for the past mm -hmm. five, ten years with devices that are increasingly locked down. Consumerization and, of the yeah, devices. It's, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe they just don't think to go deeper. Uh, you know, maybe they take a device at face value. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and maybe there's just a lack of interest because they want to press shiny buttons. You know, I don't know. I, I, you know, uh, I don't really, you know. I definitely I, experienced this. Uh, I went back after about 10, 11 years to do some contract work for the district. And uh, where we used to have classrooms, we had two or three classes of kids that were interested in computers. There was now five or six kids that were just in part of the IT club. It had really gone from multiple classrooms to just a few kids. And it seemed like the rest of the kids, uh, you know, it just wasn't that impressive because it's, ordinary. It's normal. It's not anything new and fantastical like it used to be. And it's sort of been developed now to a point where it's very consumer friendly. You don't have to learn how to make it work. It already works. And so I've been really worried about there being sort of a drop off um, and sort of a decline in interest. And that's why what you're doing, sort of allowing them to go behind the scenes if they want, seems seems so pivotal to raising a next generation of kids that are are not just comfortable using computers, but intuitively understand them, because you're giving them the ability to intuitively learn them through and through. What can people do? Like, what what it seems like what Penn Manor is doing is is brilliant to sort of solve this very problem that you and I are talking about over the long term. But it seems like a little microcosm in a much wider problem. Do you see people adopting this philosophy and approach? Do you see that spreading? Yeah, we're, we're, we're a little bit out there, <laughs> again, as you can guess. Um, but there are other districts that, that are looking closely at what we're doing. Uh, Southwestern School District in York County. Uh, we're in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. York County is the county directly to the west of us. Um, Southwestern School District has actually they've sent a team up, and they've been watching what we're doing. And uh, they're actually implementing a very similar mm. program. Mm. Um, they're going with Ubuntu um, they're going, uh, and, and modeling, not exactly, but, but pretty close for their high school. 
So, you know, there is, there's a little bit of momentum growing. You know, we really didn't set out to, to create a movement, of course. You know, we just wanted to provide a, a phenomenal educational solution for our kids. You know, but there is truly strength in numbers. And I think as many other districts, if, if districts begin to look at this type of solution, it, it will build. Uh, you know, you said in there, too, what, what can folks do to try to get kids interested in computing again? You know, I think for those of us that are in the industry, uh, don't underestimate the power of going in and speaking uh, to your schools during a career day. Um, you know, I, I try to take every opportunity that I can at Penn Manor to speak as part of career day. Mm. Uh, just actually this past week, um, I spoke with middle school kids and talked a little bit about what I do, you know, from the management leadership perspective of IT. Mm -hmm. But the second half of that talk, I had them um, in front of Ubuntu desktops and I said, we're going to, let's tell you what, let's try some command line tricks. We opened up a terminal and I just showed them some fun things like, you know, a calendar and time and, um, you know, how to reverse text on a command line. Um, you know, and uh, apt to get, you know, aptitude to get, you know, get the locale up, you know, and all that stuff. And just those kind of goofy little tricks mm -hmm. suddenly was enough of a trigger for a number of those students to, to get them interested in digging a little bit deeper, not just taking a computer as being a face value type device. Neat. That's a great. That's a that's a great way to start, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what kind of uh, as, just as we're as long as we're on the topic of spreading this, uh, there must have been some substantial roadblocks you've run into that you could you maybe didn't expect or you did fully expect, but is there anything that's sort of agnostic enough that you could warn people about? When you start to launch this, expect these kinds of problems. Like I noticed you mentioned uh, you're rolling out own cloud. Has centralized collaboration been more challenging than you expected, these kinds of things? Um, not, not so much with centralized collaboration. We, we've used Google Docs mm -hmm. for a number of years, mm -hmm. you know, and that's worked out really well for our teachers. I think that I think there's there's two discussions that are that are actually three that are happening in parallel. Um, we're talking we talked a little bit about the student apprenticeship program that we're doing, so that's a support model for you know for a one to one program. Um, there's the one to one itself rolling out the machines, and I think there's some there's another topic that's happening in parallel here that we didn't touch upon too much. But mm -hmm. this is again this is first and foremost an educational initiative. And to achieve our objectives, you know, to really help our teachers and support the, the transformations that this causes in a classroom, mm -hmm. you have to have a professional development plan. Uh, we spent time with our teachers talking not only about what Linux and open source was, and, and we, honestly, we didn't spend a ton of time on that. Most of our time as we were as we were doing professional development and training with our teachers was talking to them and having conversations and, and workshops about how suddenly what happens or what what does the transformation look like or what does the classroom look like when now every single student has a computer all the time? Yeah. You know, that's, that's a huge part of this. And, yeah. and again, we're kind of in the tech sector here and we, we want to focus on the technology pieces, but the learning transformation I think is, yeah. is the most fascinating and the most valuable part of this. And, right. and again, to get there to kind of knock down some of those obstacles, uh, it, it really comes down to professional development and working with your teachers and staff and your community and parents um, to make the program successful. Is in he... fact, I would say, Nothing else matters outside of the professional development and working with your community. See that 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 it seems like it's funny. So yeah, you're right. We're focused on the technology, but there's so much other stuff that happens when you give these students laptops. I mean, just just trusting them to take care of a machine and and sort of that alone is is something that not a lot of kids you know have to. Uh, it's it's like maybe their first computer in some cases, or their first their own computer, not the family computer. So that right there is a big deal. But I I wanted getting on the trust thing a little more. Am I understanding that there's in your IT department there's less than ten actual staff members for all the entire district, right? Not just oh, the yeah. high school that has seventeen hundred laptops, but the entire school district, less than ten employees. So how much how much are you reliant on the student help and? How much access, like, could they go log into a router? Like, what? where do you draw the line there? Oh. Yeah, that's a great question. So that's correct. We have, um, I have nine direct technology reports um, at Penn Manor School District. Uh, to give you a sense of, of what that means, we have 10 buildings. Our student population is in the neighborhood of about 5,200 students. Um, we support some in the neighborhood of 4,000 devices. Okay. Um, and my IT team is not just building level techs. I also have two engineers on that team, uh, system network engineers. There's a data person who really, she spends most of her time uh, working on our state reports and mm -hmm. databases and um, all of our state mandated reporting. Mm -hmm. And uh, then on top of that, we have one help desk individual. So for the size of our organization, putting aside for a moment that it's, it's a school and just looking at it from the size of it, think of it as, as, a, as a business, if you will, uh, we're incredibly lean. 
I think that you know, f for us, the the student team at the high school absolutely makes this easier. And I think often school districts don't realize that they have untapped resources in their students. A and many districts just will not consider bringing you know kids in to help with with IT support. Now that being said, we we do have boundaries and we do have parameters. Mm -hmm. For example, our, our student team doesn't have credentials to log into our routers. Okay. Right. Uh, our student team, in fact, doesn't have the ability to do anything really on our staff or, or teacher production network. Right. Oh, okay. And that's really where we draw the line. Okay. So right. and, and that's necessary, of course, because you don't want kids pulling a Ferris Bueller and going in and right. changing grades, for example. Right? <laughs> I, was, I was just about to say that could be. A, hmm. right. Yeah. OK. That could so. be a problem. Right. <laughs> you know, although if they can, you could argue if they can break into the system and change grades and maybe we want to hire them later. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's neither here nor there. Um, but again, so we do draw, we do have, have boundaries. And that's really worked out well for us. And, and I think, again, what's very powerful about that is that in this model, in, in this setup, we have students doing peer support for other students. Mm. And, and what, that, what that does, what that, I think, with, with our kids is it builds tremendous self-confidence. Yeah. You know, where now they're suddenly the experts in front of their peers. And, and you know, there's so few high school experiences that can, that can provide that, mm -hmm. right? You know, where it sort of flips that traditional, you know, teacher up here and student down here hierarchy. Right. Not only does it sometimes flip it, but it, it levels it out. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just key, right? It's just incredibly empowering for kids and, and just the self-confidence and the, the maturity, um, you know, that, that, that they – you know, that, that builds. It's just amazing to yeah, watch. Yeah, when I was in school, uh, if you were one of the computer geeks, well, then you were a nerd, right? Yeah. And yeah. so uh, and later on, uh, actually, the same thing started to happen to me is the teachers started bringing me in to fix their computers and things like that. So the kids started asking. But you're right. It Traditionally, for some of us that were going to school a long time ago, it it was sort of a stigma to be that person. So this is not only does it flip that the teacher student paradigm, but it totally changes a little bit of the social dynamic between yeah. the computer geeks and the students that need help. And there's sort of more of a mutual respect, I would imagine there. Absolutely. But That's very I, I powerful. Think without a doubt, you know, when people have asked me, you know, what was your favorite or what do you think was the high point of the entire one to one experience at the high school? And this was last school year when we rolled out. I have a I have a picture slide somewhere that I've used all over the place. And it's one of our help desk students that is that is front and center leading a training session. Just yeah. an, a, a quick orientation to Ubuntu and how to move around the dock. And teaching find things. parent or the teachers as well, right? Teaching there's there's it's it's geared toward the students, but there's teachers there watching. And I just I just love everything about that because mm -hmm. it completely kicks the hierarchy to the curb and and truly empowers kids to do meaningful, interesting work in, in school. And honestly, without a doubt, that is my favorite point. All the, te the technology is cool, the initiative is neat, you know, I love that it's a large project, but watching those kids being front and center, that was that was the high point, and just nothing beats that. So Charlie, what's next for the one-to-one uh, -one program? I mean, if I, if I were you and I was in your position, every summer I'd probably be tweaking the program a little bit, maybe the deployment or something. Uh, so what now is the, as you've been running it for a little while now, what kind of adjustments would you like to make? And if somebody else was going to start a program or initiative like this, maybe give them a little forewarning on. Yeah, we, um, in terms of next steps at this point, we're, we have uh, a, a number of discussions beginning to happen about extending our one-to-one -one down to our middle grades. Awesome. Uh, right now, our high school is just, uh, it simply runs from, well, our high school is grades 9 through 12, and that's that's really the scope of the one-to-one. -one. Okay. Uh, but we're talking very seriously about including grades uh, 7 and 8 for next year. Mm-hmm. And then maybe even beyond that, you know, how, you know, how young, you know, into, into elementary do we go? You know, where do we start? And I think that's that's well down the road. But really, our immediate focus is, is bringing, you know, how what kind of model we can use to bring up uh, grade seven and eight. You know, I would say that, you know, for for districts that, that are, again, two questions, right? There's the one to one question, mm -hmm. which is a dramatic instructional technology shift yeah. in your district. And then there's the how do you implement it uh, question. Yeah. On the latter, I think that, you know, again, this model works so well because it is open in every way, right? It allows kids to be full participants in the technology program. Plus, it, obviously, it's open, right? You know, and there's the freedom that comes with using open source software. But there's also the tremendous cost savings. Um, you know, I calculated that, you know, with our program last year, just by simply not inst not purchasing Windows and not purchasing Office, you know, by by the combination of Ubuntu and LibreOffice alone yeah. was able to save us three hundred sixty thousand dollars at the high school. Wow! So that's a tremendous savings, and you know I think that you know 
again, districts should be looking at that, right? Because that's money that can be reinvested into other programs. Yeah, or even just hardware. I mean, if you kept it in the computer program, you could buy more hardware, buy more teacher computers, things like that. Or we could fund more teachers. Yeah, yeah. Which in the end is not, is, you know, would would be phenomenal. Yeah, that would be great. So I think, too, you know, for districts looking at this, there's the cost savings aspect. But but again, I I wouldn't go into a one-to-one type program unless you define a philosophy first. You know, and you start to ask questions about why are you doing this? You know, for us, you know, we had a we had a whole set of guiding principles that a district level committee and then a high school steering committee, you know, teachers and and principals, administrators, board members, we we put together a number of guiding principles about why we were even doing one to one. Mm -hmm. So that would that's always my first suggestion to districts, you know, to stop and think about why are you going down this route? Helps focus everyone and get everybody on the same page. Yeah, 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 you know, but you know, before you spend a lick of money on hardware or even begin to have a discussion about what type of device, yeah, you got to go into it with some type of educational philosophy. What do you, if you were observing your kids, observing your classrooms, what would you like them doing? Mm-hmm. So I think that's probably my greatest advice. And then, yeah. you know, I would say as well, don't be afraid of open source and Linux. You know, many folks out in the community, they they still think command line and getting video drivers working and just a tangled mess, you know, mm-hmm. a whole hairball of problems. But mm-hmm. as we know, it's not like that anymore. You mm-hmm. know, in fact, this, it could be as turnkey as you'd like to make it. Um, you know, we've developed a pretty sophisticated imaging system and we do a lot with Puppet and we build images, but it doesn't have to be that way. There's, there are simple solutions. So just don't fear, don't fear Linux. So Charlie, my last couple questions for you. If I'm following, it sounds like, uh, and looking by the, judging by the pictures too, uh, you guys opted to go with ThinkPads and uh, an Ubuntu derivative or Ubuntu itself as the uh, Linux distribution of choice. Is, are both those assumptions right? We uh, we actually started at our elementary level. Uh, we were using X120 and X130 um, Lenovo um, machines. Okay. So that's where we start the elementary. Yeah. Uh, at the high school level, we actually decide on Acer Travelmate units. Oh, okay. 11.6-inch uh, screens, uh, six-cell batteries. Uh-huh. Um, batteries important because you need to be able to get through a full instructional day, about six hours. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and really for us, it, it, it came down to, you know, cost, of course. Um, you know, pretty good Linux support. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, you know, it varies, as we know. Mm-hmm. Um but also trying to find a lightweight machine as well. Some of the, some of the ThinkPads can be a little heavy. Mm. Um, I think going forward, though, I may look at them again because they're a little more rugged. Mm. Um, nothing against the Acers. We really like them. But, but I think we need something with, with a little more toughness. Um, and, um, you know, kids are going to be kids. They're going to bump things. Yeah, and, and we just need to try and, to prevent. Yeah, yeah it, it happens. Right, adults yeah. do it, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think going forward, one, you know, in the past, one of the trade-offs was something that was lighter, but I think maybe a better trade-off is to go with something that's a little more heavier. But we continue to tweak that that mixture and that recipe going forward as yeah. we do replacements and as we look at middle school. Sure. Very cool. Well, uh, Charlie, also in the show notes, I'll have a link to uh, Penn Manor's GitHub page. Uh, uh, your TEDx talk, as well as a recent article on the 8th that you wrote. Uh, I think it, you wrote this for opensource.com, which is a great read, Root Access for Students at Penn Manor, which is awesome. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to cover or let folks know about before we run? Yeah, I, like I said, just, you know, don't be afraid. And, and for, for those of us in the industry, uh, you know, get involved. You know, just, again, I think a, a career day is, is a real easy way, you know, for us to, to sort of push into schools and, and have some conversations with students and, and, and show kids what we do. You know, that there's so much more than just tablet-like devices. Um, you know, yes. that, that, that computing and engineering is, is this incredibly rich art in many ways. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think we can do that. You know, I, th- I think it's, it's sometimes tough to break down some conceptions, uh, many misconceptions in education. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I just say just, just try to get involved in, in, in your schools. You know, kids are, kids are sponges and they're, they're so creative and they, and they love this stuff. Sometimes they just need a little push to, to, to get them headed in the right direction. Well, I'm super excited by uh, the initiative and uh, I'm really impressed by your whole team yeah. and all of the students that you have on the uh, staff with you too. It's, uh, it's, it's, I think, I hope, going to serve as a model, and hopefully it'll spread over time. And uh, I wish you guys all of the success going forward. And uh, keep us posted. You know, I think uh, I think if you got enough people interested, you guys could have an, your own podcast just on this stuff oh, yeah. alone. Easily. Yeah, right? The Easily. management of it, the deployment, <laughs> all of it. I think you could have weeks of content, Charlie. <laughs> hmm, that's a great idea, actually. Right? Yeah, there you go. And then, about that. and then the parents could download, and they could get on board with what you're doing. It yeah, could be a, yeah. yeah. All right, Charlie. Well, thanks so much for coming on the Linux Action Show. I got links to all your stuff in the show notes if people want to find out more. Keep up the great work, and uh, we'll follow uh, as things develop, okay? Great. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Really appreciate coming on today. You bet.
And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Big thank you to Charlie for coming on. Be sure to go check out all the links to his stuff. Crazy inspired by that. Matt, we've got a couple of emails to cover, and I want to talk about the touchscreen stuff. Uh, Our first email comes in from friend of the show, Mr. Michael Dominic, co-host of Coder Radio, and he just wanted to pass along to the Linux Action Show audience that he's got a fingertip tech Thanksgiving sale at fingertiptech.com. That's his company where he does uh, professional development consulting and contracting work. They say 20% off any web or mobile fixed bid or fixed scope project that closes before Thanksgiving. 20% off. Wow, that's some so, serious stuff. This would be a good time to do If it. you've got somebody you've needed some development done, uh, well, well, who better than trust than one of our hosts? Yeah. Check out fingertip.tech, fingertip.tech or finger, what is it? fingertip.technology is the other domain. And uh, go uh, go hire those guys. They've got a good uh, Thanksgiving sale going on right now. I think that's a great idea. They also, if this is kind of your bag, just recently did a blog post on uh, the hidden costs of offshoring development work, Yes, which is an interesting read, and they have a really good perspective on it. So you can find that on the fingertip.technology blog. Hey, Matt, so yes. uh, last week around this time, I asked the audience, what do you think about the Surface, and how does it work with Linux? <laughs> and people are and, like, and such a warm it. reception. You know? yeah. And I, I just really wanted something that I could fit right here. See, we've got the drone cam, and I just wanted yeah. something I could put right here, Matt. And uh, mm. um, the idea was is maybe reach out and scroll the screen from time to time and uh, put it, the end goal would be to like connect it to like a System76 rig or something under right. the table that's uber powerful, take the Bonobo home. So I have a gaming rig at home because yeah. right now I got nothing at home other than a Chromebook. And uh, so I hooked this up a couple of days ago. I find it to be a lot of fun, way more useful, way, way more useful than I thought it would be. It turns out, like when you're presenting, it's really nice to reach out and touch the thing you're presenting. Like if there's oh, a picture man. here I want, you know, I just I just reach out and I touch the picture. And it, Boom. Yeah. I, so I have found it to be uh, a lot of fun. Touch screen support is a little hit and miss and a little buggy. Um, I'm going to try to do a episode on the state of touch support. I'll uh, load up Unity, mm-hmm. keep GNOME 3, maybe some KDE action, right. maybe Windows just to compare um, if I can bring myself to do it. And I will tell you, I'll give you, I'll try to give you a whole rundown. I've already ran into some bugs, like actual show-stopping bugs, where like if you're in a really important production mm-hmm. environment, you might want to hold off because oh, it screwed okay. me up a few times. Uh, and you know, to the Bonobos' credit. I'm now pushing this GPU three different ways wow. to the to the, to the capture machine, to the screen itself, and to this. And so gaming performance has taken a hit now that I'm oh, you think? copying yeah. the image three times. <laughs> I was going to say, that seems kind of reasonable. At 1080p each time. <laughs> the fact uh, that your game launches? 60 frames a second kinda, set. You know. Yeah, so it's one of those things where uh, it... But if I had it just connected directly up to a, a standard, uh, you know, yeah. one video port, it'd be great. Uh, so the the touch, one of the things that's been really neat is using, I have this uh, dash to dock extension, and I have it permanently always set to show. And the icons are so easy to touch in between. I can do pinch to zoom in Chrome, which is crazy fun to be able to pinch and zoom my screen like that. I've actually crashed the video driver once, uh, but it was actually a pretty graceful crash. X just yeah. sort of And it flashed. behaved itself. Yeah, uh, and I just the, was, yeah, it was, I didn't have to reboot or anything uh-huh. like that. It was, it was really recoverable. Uh, and so this was my, so instead of going with the Surface, right now I went with the touch screen. It's, uh, it reclines, so if you, if we're watching here, you can see I can, I can pull it up and it oh, comes up. Or I can, yeah. and I can, and then I can push it back down, which is a little tricky, so I just kind of leave it. But that's good. It's got resistance, so you know it's not yeah. going to go clunk. Yeah, and know. I can kind of just set it so I, yeah, yeah it's 1080p. You know, I got the 21-inch version, not the 24-inch, uh, because I needed to save a little bit of room. Good sizing choice. Yeah. And the most impressive feature I've seen with this so far is the ability to make the Microsoft Surface uh, ads and stuff disappear by closing those yeah. windows. <laughs> yeah. Die. Yeah. You know, that's great. Uh, so in, if you have Chrome, you can go in there and yeah. go into Chrome colon slash less flags and you can turn on some of the additional experimental touch support. So far, it's been working pretty good. That's really cool. Yeah. I don't Maybe that might have been what crashed my video driver earlier. but Maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there it is. And I'll give you a full state of uh, touch support as I get a chance to try out more applications and uh, more desktop environments. Not bad. Hey, just a quick announcement, Matt. Uh, Women's Tech Radio has yeah. launched on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. It features my wife, Angela, and her co-host, Paige. It's a laid-back interview talk show style show. They bring on uh, someone who's involved in the technology industry, all different sectors, and talk to them about their journey. And uh, for episode one, they had Lisa Hughes Fresh on. And what's interesting about Lisa Hughes Fresh is uh, not only is she married to an open BSD developer, but uh, which uh, got the BSD Now guy's attention, but she also also got her start in open source software development by taking advantage of Mozilla's Ascend program. And so now she's an open source developer, and they interviewed her in episode one of Women's Tech Radio about her journey. 
And uh, it turned out really well. And they record four at a time, and each episode progressively gets better and better. They really got the format down That's by awesome. episode four. So I'm, I'm really happy with the progress they made in just their initial batch. A lot of a lot of really good responses. We've had some questions about it. I want to address those on the show now, too. Um, yeah. And I thought uh, Ruckin' Time uh, uh, summarized it pretty well. He says, uh, great show. I'm a little sad that some people have given a bad response, but actually the majority's been pretty positive. He said, people need to calm down with this is sexist. So some people have proposed that the show itself is sexist. Having a show that interviews women is not sexist, he says. If that's sexist, then the Boy Scouts, gender-specific bathrooms, (laughs) gender-specific schools, and the WNBA... Which is a window, which is a women's specific sports league, are all sexist. They are not. So please leave the sexist complaints to Tumblr. Uh, here was so I wanted to answer why do we have why a separate show focusing on women getting involved in technology? Why not just interview more women in the Linux Action Show and get their journey? Which we we do and we plan to. But I I, I wrote my thoughts in the post and I just thought okay. I would I would uh, read them here. Um, so uh, I can see the point. It's where it almost seems sexist on his face to break it out into its own show. But uh, you have to remember uh, these. There is a production process to these shows, and understanding uh, the struggle that some women getting into technology have faced, the uh, headwinds they've had to face, the processes they go through, maybe any discriminations they've had to face. It's pretty hard for me, as a guy in my 30s who's never had any of that, to right. really get my head in that space. So to be genuine to the content, it's probably not appropriate that I'm the one driving it. But outside of that. It's just, you know, it's not my area. To, I don't think deeply about that. So from a practical standpoint, and to be really genuine to the concept of the show, Angela and Paige really have to have full creative show over this. They have yes. Full creative control over this show. And the way to do that is to make its own show. But also, because, because it's about reaching a new audience, having it broken out into its own separate show means that they don't have to wait and watch an hour of Linux content to watch one interview from one Bingo. person. Right, and it helps them discover these shows more easily. It helps everyone discover these shows more easily. And also, on on top of that, it it would restrict the context of the interview. So if uh, if Angela and Paige decided they wanted to talk to a iOS developer and ask her how she got started in iOS development, what tools she uses on her Macintosh to make right. iOS applications, that's not appropriate for the Linux action. No, it's show, really right? not. No. So we would not be able to have an interview like that because the context of the show would sort of restrict what the interviews could be about. So the idea here is to have a show that focuses on technology in general. Uh, Initially, they've all pretty much been open source developers Mm -hmm. because that's our area and that's where we focus the most. Uh, But it could be any topic. And we wanted to give them full creative control. We wanted to make discoverability a potential. And it's something where they need to they need to be running that. And we can continue going on here. We'll have our shows. We'll have plenty of interviews with women in technology. It doesn't make it mutually exclusive. What it does is it gives people an opportunity to find a show for them by people that understand their situation. I'm really excited about where it's going. And uh, Angela and Paige have a bunch of contacts. If you have somebody you'd like to suggest for them, you can email the show WTR at JupiterBroadcasting.com and take a listen. It's called Women's Tech Radio. But the topics are fascinating for all genders. And episode one came out on Wednesday, and episode two will be out this Wednesday at Jupiter Broadcasting. Well, and I think another piece of it, too, is, and this goes with any gender, um, you know, either gender, rather, that it feels more genuine when it's actually coming and dealing with people that are actually having these similar experiences. Mm-hmm. They may even say, oh my gosh, yeah, I've experienced something like that, very similar to that, because, you know, we've mirrored that. For Chris and I to do something like that, it it, it just, it just isn't. It just isn't accurate. Right. I mean, it's like I can I can try and empathize, mm-hmm. but you know, my my wife, for example, who's worked in uh, decor and home improvement for a long time. I mean, she rocks power tools. Um, there's a whole other world out there for women. It's not like it is for guys. Trust me. So you so having someone to represent that in their experiences on all sides of things makes more for a much more yeah. genuine show. Yeah, and it gives us uh, more content, which is always good yep. as a network, and it allows you to choose. You can opt in more easily. You can opt right. into that particular type of content, or you can opt out. So exactly. it's great for everybody. Yes. Matt, you've got a provoking piece up over with Danimation this week. I did. You know, it's like, you know, I haven't pissed anyone off this month. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I, I really need to sto- – and I did. I, I, I got some interesting co- – most of the comments were pretty decent in the article, but I got a couple of couple zingers. The case against rolling yeah. Linux distribution. So, you know, I wanted to take – because in, in the past I've taken pro – 
uh, a rolling district. But I also wanted to t- be realistic and look at it from who who might not be a match for this sort of thing. It's a good article. You know, and uh, I take a couple different views. And, of course, some of you will interpret this as Matt doesn't know how to or <laughs> Arch right. is hard. Right. When in reality what I'm saying is that it's different strokes to different folks, different yeah. points in life, blah, blah, blah. It's a, co- it's a, it's, it's yeah. a point we try to make often yeah. is the best thing about free and open source <laughs> software is <laughs> Firefox might not work for me. But it works great for you. Yeah, yeah Rolling releases exactly. might not work great for yeah. Matt, but they work great for me. And that's fine. And see, the key thing to remember here is that I lived in rolling releases right. for a yeah. year. Yeah. I didn't try it once. Ugh, actually, more, it's been more it's than been a year. It's been more than a year, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I lived it and actually can speak intelligently on my experiences with it, yeah, what I, I liked really and what I didn't like. And uh, it's always so. good to sort of get another perspective uh, before yeah. you jump into something like totally, that. Totally, totally. Hey, uh, also, check out yeah. episode 67 of Linux Unplugged. We covered the recent Debian exoduses, and uh, I, I honestly think some of the uh, some of the tone uh, has been different around your article, at least in our subreddit, because of some of the things we talked about in episode 67. Yeah, I was surprised at how, I think how tame it was, It's amazing. Actually. <laughs> it's amazing. Like, we, we, ta- we talked about, yeah. like, being uh, more generous when yeah. people make decisions like this, and I feel like a lot of the responses in the subreddit were like, hey, Matt, that's great for you. Yep. And, and some people were like, totally my experience, absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. been the same thing. Yeah. I switched to OpenSUSE. That's what Gabriel said. Yeah, totally. uh, some people have been like, that's not been my experience, right. uh, or I use an LTS kernel, and that's been Which fine. Which is good advice for people struggling yeah. with that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it was a really Instead of like this, oh, you're wrong, you don't know right, what you're doing. Right, I right, mean, that right. happens like on G+, yeah. and stuff. But in our community, yep. I was really impressed. And I, I think some of that might be because of episode 67 of Linux Unplugged. So I think that's absolutely what it is. You guys can go check out Debian Community Divided. And uh, we'll have uh, Linux Unplugged episode 68 on Tuesday. We are recording one hour earlier this week. Uh, Charlie and his students will be joining us in this week's episode. Nice. We'll get the story from the students from our interview with Charlie earlier today. And also, we're because we are recording one hour earlier, it's also Thanksgiving Eve in the U.S. It's uh, the 25th. The thing is, I don't expect a big turnout because it's Thanksgiving Eve. And the reason we're recording an hour earlier is every year at Jupiter Broadcasting, we try to come up with something we can do for the host to say thank you for once again showing up every single week, making, making sure that we have an episode for our audience every single week without missing a beat. Thank you. And how do you thank somebody for that level of dedication? And the best thing we could come up with was, let's give them the holiday week off. No shows. For the first time since you started your show, let's take a week off. And the only way we can really do that is if we can come together as a community and find a bunch of best of clips. So Tuesday, after Linux Unplugged, we're going to assemble in our mumble room and whoever can help us, we're going to go work from a common doc and a common form and we'll, we'll have some instructions, and we're going to go out and tear through the 2014 content of Jupiter Broadcasting, find the best moments, document their location, their time code, all of that, and then behind the scenes, we'll be putting together some best of 2014 episodes picked by the audience for the holiday week in December, so that way we can give all of the hosts and Rikai, the editor, the week off. But we need your help, and because Linux Unplugged is going to be an hour earlier and it's on Thanksgiving Eve, we really do need your help. So get your mumble set up and join us Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific. You can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that in your local time, and it's jblive.tv. Good stuff. And it'll be great to have Charlie in the class there, too. So yeah. I think it's going to be a great... Oh, totally. I, I hope we have a good turnout. I think we're going to have a great chat with Charlie. If you've got any follow-up questions for him, you can always show up. We'll involve the mumble room as well. It's our virtual lug. You can be part of the discussion. It's a super accessible podcast that you can be directly part of. It's kind of our open motto. That's right. So uh, join us on Tuesday for that. Last but not least, two things I want to give you. The subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Submit content, stories, runs Linux, engage with the community, and comment. All of that stuff is super valuable, and it makes every episode better. We couldn't do it without your contributions. You can also email us. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Click that contact link. Choose Linux Action Show from the drop-down. Put in your message, and then our robots will hand-deliver it for you. We have robots, people. Actual I pay them robots. in Bitcoin, so take That's advantage right. of it because I just pay hourly. I think it's <laughs> like half the Bitcoin transactions at this point. So you got to help me out because I'm going to be Bitcoin poor. jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. All right, anything else? I think that's, that's it. it. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. So here we are. We're driving down to see Fleetwood Mac, and uh, we're stuck in traffic. There's mm-hmm. road construction, all this kind of stuff. We're on the freeway. Right. And I got to pee. Oh, don't you hate that? See, And I got to is... pee not just a little bit, Matt. Like, I had to pee when we left for the concert. 
two hours ago, I had to pee, like, not a little bit, but a lot of it. Like, one of them real bad oh, kind of yeah. got to pee. See, that's when you got to have, like, a super big gulp cup and an adapter. Well, here's what yeah. I did. <laughs> Just saying. So, my wife's a fan of the, uh, of the uh, Mountain Dew. And there was a few Mountain Dews, yeah. empty bottles rolling around in the car. You're not trying to talk two liter because that can be a disaster waiting. No, to no, okay. no. But you know, because uh, that's that's control. But if you think about, <laughs> but if you think about the size of the um, of the bottle opening, it is not actually big enough. It's, you got to shoot yeah. into the opening. Yeah, I was gonna say that that's like yeah. that's carnival tricks. Stuff, yeah, you, you got to be. You got to. Yeah. You actually, it actually takes some. You got to so. have some pretty serious. Trim. And then you got blowback on top of it. Right, so. and then you also got the problem of like drivers by looking. So anyway, yeah, and you're all. <laughs> exactly, I had to yeah. do it, Matt. I tried right, to resist yeah. it, but I, I had to do it. I yeah, broke yeah. out the bottle. I peed in a bottle on the way down. Yeah. To see Fleetwood Mac, but it was just enough where I didn't have to pee through the whole concert. Right, right. right. So that was you great. cut your stream, and we were running late, so that was good. We get to the concert, we go there. There's, uh, I think, I think this is just a rough guesstimation, but I believe 500 million people were in the building. It's oh crazy. my god! Yeah. Really now, crazy. now on the way down, now the ten thousand dollar question is, which seat were you in when Passenger. you were in the Okay, yeah, Andrew's driving. Because that would have been that would have been some mad skills. That's oh no, some, I've done that. That's some neat. Dude, driving. I used to, I used to, I was a contractor. <laughs> I was on the road constantly. Right, Let's yeah, not kid yeah. her. But, road, road warrior. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so we get out of there. We get. So I managed to go through the whole concert without yeah. having to take a leak because I because I'd released into the bottle in the car. You got enough. Yeah, yeah. So we go there, and because there's so many people, you're not just leaving. Like the city, the city of Tacoma is not big enough for all those people I'll to be in it. one place and then all just leave at the same time. So we go back to the parking garage, and we're sitting. We we sat in the parking garage without even being able to pull out of our spot for like 25 minutes. Oh, and I already got to pee again. By See, this and point. I and I and I yeah, patience wise, that yeah. would be hard for me. The 20 minute mark comes up. Ooh. And Angie and I are just kind of sitting there. By this point, we've lost ourselves in our smartphones and we're just doing whatever just to kill time, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting there looking at like Instagram or something <laughs> and I hear this <laughs> you know, like this like this traveling honk, like oh, somebody's wow. driving through the parking garage honking and I look up and I'm trying to find it and I see uh, like a which looks like a nice brand new jo- Dodge Charger. Yeah. And this guy honk as he drives and he's driving around all the traffic and about the same time I I found his position, the dude drives straight into the wall. Just smashes into the wall. Like, I don't know what the hell he was doing. I don't know if he was drunk. <laughs> and oh, got wow. out of the car and went and checked on him. He said he didn't speak much English, but he seemed yeah. sober. Okay. And then he just kind of sat there for like 10 minutes. And then we all just, like the cop came, like a cop eventually came over and checked on him, yeah. let him go. And they just got in with the rest of the traffic as we started leaving and just left. Like, what the Like, that was the weirdest thing. That to is see that. just, you know, but I'll t- I guess that's how you end a car.